Bibles. I, I know you've been standing, but if you can, I just think it's good to stand as we read God's Word together. And um, it's a holy word and sanctified word and just an honor and respect, if you can. Matthew 12. We'll start reading at verse 38. A few Bibles and page numbers on the screen. And some of the Pharisees and teachers of the law said to him, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. He answered, A wicked and adulterous generation asks for a sign, but none will be given it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was in was three days and three nights in the belly of a huge fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And the people of Nineveh will stand up at the judgment with this generation to condemn it. For they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and no one greater than Jonah is here. But the queen of the south will rise at the judgment in this generation and condemn it. For she came from the ends of the earth to listen to Solomon's wisdom, and now one greater than Solomon is here. When an evil, when an evil spirit comes out of anyone, it goes through arid places seeking rest and does not find it. Then it says, I'll return to the house I left. When it arrives, it finds the house unoccupied, swept clean and put in order. Then it goes and takes with it seven other spirits more wicked, wicked than itself, and they go in and live there. And the final condition of that person is worse than the first. That is how it will be with this wicked generation. Um, some big words from Jesus this morning. Um, we're going to have a little up on the screen. It's the word of God for the people of God. And you said, thanks be to God. You may be seated this morning. Uh, let's pray one more time before we jump in. And I think God has a word for us. For me, for me, for sure. Let's pray. Lord, we uh, we, we need you, and um, because without you, we're just not going to make it. And, and so, Lord, help us this morning as we look at these words, they're pretty big words, serious words, and um, so help us, God, help us. And God, nobody needs you now more than I do, and so God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be pleasing and acceptable to you. Um, so let's, let's just kind of jump in. So in verse 38, some of the Pharisees came and said, teacher, um, we want you to do a sign for us. Now this word teacher is, is kind of a badge of an unbeliever, somebody who doesn't believe that Jesus is who he says he is. No disciple ever called Jesus teacher. Um, they always address Jesus as Lord, but never teacher. And so we get this hint that they don't believe in who Jesus is claiming that he is because of what they call him. In the first century, there were many prophets who made messianic claims. Uh, funny how today we still have some of those people. And, and so they would make a claim, and, and the way that they would tell if this person was the Messiah or not was they would perform a miracle. They would perform a trick. They would perform something. Um, but it wasn't just anything. They had to almost uh, say what they were going to do. They had to say, this is what I'm going to do, and to prove that I'm Messiah, I'm going to make sure that it happens. And... Uh, and so, uh, so what do they want Jesus to do? They want him to, um, to do something that's going to allow them and show them who he is. What are they asking Jesus to do? Uh, maybe you remember this commercial from a long time ago, but I think this is what they're asking Jesus to do. Um, let's play that. What's in the bag? Lunch. Big Mac, fries. Play it for it. You and me for my Big Mac? First one to miss watches the winner eat. No dunking. <laughs> one beat. Which me? Get in there. Off the floor, off the scoreboard, off the bank board, no rim. Over the second rafter, off the floor, nothing but that. Through the window, off the wall, nothing but that. What you want is what you get in the of the day. Off the expressway, over the river, off the billboard, through the window, off the wall, nothing but that. Let me remember these commercials. You say, they're asking Jesus to shoot a basketball shot? No, they're not asking Jesus to shoot a basketball They're asking him to call his shot, though. And, and, and they're asking Jesus to step up and say, you can't just do something. you got to tell us what you're going to do. 
because that's the only way we're going to know. Uh, maybe these things were just accident, or they just happened by chance, or they just happened because of whatever. So you got to call your shot off the rafter, off the scoreboard, you know, nothing but net, and, and make it happen so that that's what it looks like. Because I guess healing of the sick evidently wasn't, um, it did not count as a messianic activity because of many people around that time where we're doing things that people were getting better. And so that couldn't be the only sign. So they're asking Jesus, do something and prove it. Now, this isn't the old, the first time that Jesus has been asked to prove that he was the Messiah. Uh, in fact, if you have your Bibles, flip over to Mark chapter 4. We looked at this last year, the first Sunday of Lent. Um, but just to kind of re, a reminder, so this isn't the first time that Jesus has been asked to prove that he is the Messiah. Mark chapter 4. I don't have the page number, but just flip a few chapters to the left. And it says this. Verse 1, Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Now this if is not the, 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 the tempter or the enemy trying to see if Jesus really is. He knows who Jesus is. So it's not a matter of are you, but... Since you are the Son of God, what does it mean for you to be the Son of God? And what does it mean for you to live into that title and into that idea? And so there was this thought back then that when Messiah would come, all people would be fed and people wouldn't go hungry. In fact, if you look at Acts 2, that's kind of what they did is they, they just took care of people and they fed people. And it kind of harkens back to the wilderness. Jesus is in the wilderness when God rained down bread from heaven and fed everybody. Nobody was hungry. And so he's saying, hey, if you do this, Jesus, since you're the Son of God, Everybody will think you're the Messiah. Everybody will. And so what is he saying? Prove it. Do a trick. Do a miracle. Do something. Because then everybody will come out and think this is the Messiah because all people are being fed. And so not the first time. Interesting who's coming this time and asking the same exact thing that the tempter, the enemy himself, asked in Mark chapter 4. Hey, Jesus, can you prove? Can you prove? The wickedness of this demand consists in the unwillingness to believe that God has sent Jesus, that Jesus is the one sent from God. And the sign isn't just a miracle, but it's some unambiguous proof of his identity. Because let's remember, as we've been studying what has happened, the blind see, the deaf hear, the lepers are cleansed, the mute speak, the paralyzed walk, the demon possessed are made whole. Heaven opens up and a voice says, this is my son. I mean, what more do you need? Seems like you would look at all of that idea and say, yes, he is who he says he is. However, in this context, the demand does not indicate an openness, like they need to be convinced, but it's more of a hard heart. And there's probably no sign that Jesus could do that's going to remove the scales from their eyes because they're really not looking to be convinced. They're looking for another way that they can trap him and make him fit to who they think he is supposed to be. Back to Matthew chapter 12, um, verse 39. He answered, a wicked and adulterous generation asked for a sign, but none will be given and given it, except the sign of Jonah, or the pro of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a huge fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The people of the Nineveh will stand up at the judgment in this generation and condemn it, for they repented at the preaching of Jonah and no one greater than Jonah is here. The queen of the south will rise at the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For she came from the ends of the earth to listen to Solomon's wisdom. And no one greater than Solomon is here. And so two questions. Why doesn't Jesus just give him a sign? Second one, what's the sign of Jonah? So there's going to be a sign coming. The sign of Jonah that's going to show you who I really am. Jonah's stay in the sea monster is a foreshadowing of where Jesus is headed. The sign of Jonah, he says, is, is, is a foreshadowing of Jesus' three days in the belly of the earth and his resurrection from the dead. And, and so Jesus is saying, don't worry, a sign's coming that's going to just blow you all away. It's going to be something like you've never seen before. Somebody who dies and is in the ground for three days and is resurrected from the dead. You want me just to do something cool, snap my fingers, eyes are open, or do something cool that, that, that is this proof? There's a sign coming that will let you know exactly where I come from and who I am. 
something greater, Jesus says, may not, probably wasn't just talking about Jesus himself, but the kingdom and the movement that Jesus has set up, that people are coming and knowing more of who God is and who he's called us to be. His miracles weren't done for the sake of, of putting on a show. His miracles weren't done for the sake of, of trying to point to him. Listen to this. His miracles were because he had compassion on people. <laughs> he saw people who were hurting, and he wanted them to be better. It, it was a, a, a symbol, an ushering in of the kingdom that he was setting up. It had nothing to do with, watch what I can do. Look how good I am. Look how great I can be. But it had everything to do with who Jesus and the, the mission and the kingdom and so Jesus said, there's something greater than even me touching these people. It's this movement of God that's bringing all people back to himself. It's this movement that, that's taking the brokenness that we talked about last week that the enemy wants and putting it back together. That the brokenness that, that is rampant and, and God redeeming and bringing that back to himself. And so will the authorities be convinced of the resurrection? We know the, the story. We'll get there at some point, but no. So what is Jesus saying? He's saying, hey, I'm just telling you that I'm going to put a final stamp on this whole thing. I'm going to show you and prove to you once and for all that I am sent from God. And so the, the, the death and resurrection wasn't a, a, a slap in the face of all the people, but he's saying this is going to just final seal of approval from my Father in heaven that's not going to allow me to stay in the ground, but it's going to raise me up from the dead and put a stamp of approval on all the things that I've been a part of from this point forward. And so he's saying there's a sign of Jonah. Something's coming that is just going to blow your mind. It's going to show you something that's beyond yourself. But even then, you're still not going to be a part. You're still not going to believe. You're still not going to join this because you're really not looking to be convinced. You're just looking for something that's going to make the crowds even more upset for whatever reason. Let's read on verse 43. When an evil spirit comes out of anyone, it goes through the arid places seeking rest and does not find it. Then it says, I'll return to the house I left. When it arrives, it finds the house unoccupied, swept, clean, and put in order. Then it goes and takes with it seven other spirits more wicked than itself, and they go in and live there. And the final condition of that person is worse than the first. That is how it will be with this wicked generation. Um, okay. Um, so Jesus isn't, let's just jump in. Jesus isn't, it's not a reflection on um, a big word, on the ontological status of evil. Now, what that means is this isn't like Jesus trying to say, this is how evil exists in these arid places. So he isn't trying to say, this is what it looks like, but rather, uh, he is again reminding us that we can't serve God and something else. Money, fame, uh, whatever, status, whatever the case is. And it's again Jesus saying, whoever's not for me is against me. So coming at the end of this long where the Pharisees are just pounding and pounding and questioning and questioning. And, and a long series of disputes that have dominated chapter 12 of Matthew. This parable, this parable is kind of the final blow. Their last state is going to be worse than where they are right now. The last state is far worse than where they were at the beginning. Because they refuse to acknowledge that God is doing something in this person of Jesus. If the saints from Jesus, he may have used it uh, as a warning. And you say, what kind of warning? Uh, the warning that, that some of the benefits that, that, that people, I know this is none of you. So don't hear me saying this about you. Okay? None of this next part's about you. It's about the people that aren't here. And um, they'll see it on Facebook or wherever like that. Um, warning those people who want the benefits of Jesus' ministry without the commitment. It's the people who, 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 who love the fact that Jesus can do all kinds of stuff, yet they're, they're still reluctant to say, you can have my life, whatever you want. We like it when you do this, Jesus, and it's cool when you heal people, and I love it you know, when you touch blinded eyes, and that's awesome. But I'm still not ready to, to, to allow you to do whatever you want with my, my life. Um, so when Martin Luther uh, nailed his thesis on the door in Wittenberg and, um, and started this whole thing that we're a part of, and it was called the Protestant Reformation. 
for so long, we have uh, been known for what we are against because of this. We're the, we're the protesters, the Protestants. Uh, that's where our name comes from. And, uh, and so Luther nailed his protest on the door of the Catholic Church, and thus was born the movement of people who were against a lot of things. Uh, and, but there arose a problem when he hung that on there. Uh, then it arose, started, and, and maybe it wasn't a big deal then, but it, it kind of became even a bigger deal, I want to say, like in the, the 50s and the 60s and the 70s of 1900, not 1700 when Luther did. But there became this problem in the church during those decades and probably before that. And I'm afraid that, that we at the church became more known for what we are against than what we're for. We, 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 there was so much stuff going on. And listen, I'm not saying that, I'm not, I, I'm not saying that, that what they did was bad. But I'm saying that we can learn a few things as we look at history and the church and where we've come from and what it looks like. That, that there, there arose because of all the, the sex, drugs, and rock and roll and all the stuff that was happening in the 60s and 70s and free love and the whole deal. That, that what happened is we got to take a stand and be against all that stuff. And there's nothing wrong with that. I'm not standing here saying we should have applauded, okay? So don't hear that at all. But the problem is we, we were against so much, but we never said, but this is what we're, we're for. And so this word translated, um, empty, um, unoccupied in my version, uh, it, it is in the ordinary Greek word is more than just um, than empty, okay? It's more than just saying that there's nothing in the house and, and what that looks like. And, and it's very unusual because we would say the empty is, is an adjective. It describes something. I'm not good at English, so if I mess this up, come tell me later. Not right now, but later. And, um, but in Greek, it's not an adjective describing what, the, the, what is happening. It's a participle. Woo! Let's go home. That was, that's it. That's all I got. And uh, No, it's a participle. Now, a, a, a participle, from what I understand... Um, is, is you, you add like ing onto the end of, of something that describes something. And it's not just something that describes, but it actually has an action connotation. And it actually gives some type of movement uh, as opposed to just being empty. It's like there's something going on that causes it to be empty. Okay? Now, you're not getting blessed yet, and I understand. That's cool. Um, but so the Greek word, if you go to the next slide, is this word slazako um, or something like that. I can't, I didn't take Greek. And, and, and in essence, it means to be idle. It's not just idle, it's to be idle. Now, should we be against things? Of course. However, if we're not careful, if we don't allow people to see and show people what we're for, if we don't fill the void, the empty, left by things that we're against, then we might be worse off than we were before. I saw this quote, and I didn't even mean to find it. It just kind of happened on me one day, and it's going to be on the screen by Hannah Moore, who lived in the 17th century, and she says this, Life is a short day, but it is a working day. Activity may lead to evil, but inactivity cannot lead to good. Activity may lead to evil things, so you doing something may cause you to do something evil, but just sitting there isn't going to bring about good. Um, and, and so it's this action. It's not just this that God takes things away. This that God calls me to actually commit to something and and be about something and do something. Um, if you have your Bibles, Micah chapter six. Do I have that? Yeah, good. I have the page number on there. Micah chapter six. I love this passage. Micah chapter six. So the, the, the prophet Micah is, is asking questions, and we've looked at this passage before, but it's so fitting with life and, and what it looks like. And so he says, what can I come before the Lord? A thousand bulls? No, ten thousand? No, a hundred thousand? Uh, can I come before him with it? For, can I, shall I offer my firstborn for my transgression, from the food, fruit of my body and sin of my body? So what can I give the Lord? What does the Lord require? What is he looking for? And verse 8 of Micah 6 says this, he has shown you, shown all you people what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. And so these are action words. He doesn't just say, hey, I did this for you. Just enjoy the rest of your life. It's to act justly, to love 
mercy and to walk humbly with your God. He doesn't call us to do nothing. Another guy, another quote will be on the screen. The Christian life is not merely the absence of bad things. It is the presence of good things. The life of faith is not a vacant lot where sin used to be. It's an active neighborhood where justice, mercy, and peace live together. God did not call us to be saved, sanctified, and petrified. He didn't call us to get saved, sanctified, and take up space on a pew. He didn't call us that says, hey, I'm going to take all this stuff out of your life. And we're like, that's awesome because I couldn't do that myself. And now I'm just going to come to church and sit and soak it all up and, and, and be. It's not what he called us to. The, the sanctified life, the life of the holy life, if you're not familiar with Nazarene term, though, the holy life, the life that God calls us to be a part of, is not a life where I just come in and, and take up space. It's a life of actively seeking to be about God's justice, actively seeking to love others, actively seeking to be a part of the mercy that God had for me and giving that to other people. And if we're not careful, we can say, thank you, God. I, I want the benefits of you taking all the sin out of my life. And Jesus says the, the, the house is kept, it's swept up, it's cleaned, it's good. But if we're not careful, if we don't fill our lives with who God has called us to be, if we don't fill our lives with the holiness that he calls us to be a part of, then other things are going to come by and think, this is a nice house. And then he's going to go invite all his friends to come in and occupy because it's so nice and because it's been cleaned. It's been cleaned. And we're going to be worse off than we were before. Oh, that's a hard word. You're telling me that I could be worse by coming and sitting and filling a pew thinking I'm okay? Yeah. In fact, I think in C.S. Lewis's screw tape letters, that's, that's the biggest trick of the enemy. Let's just let them think that they're okay. And they'll do more good for us than they'll do for me. If we can just get in their mind, you're fine. You don't have to do anything else. You're fine. And then Wormwood and, and the other just had this conversation. And if we can get believers to think they're okay, then we've already won. <laughs> there are more R's in that, that state than they were beforehand. They're going to do more damage to God's kingdom and what it looks like than they would have before. And so God doesn't call us to come down and, and, and to think that, you know what, God has saved me. He's taken all the junk out of my life. I'm good. As long as I come and listen, as long as I come and sing, as long as I'm a part of what God's doing, then everything is going to be okay. We talk about how Jesus told us to love God and love others in Matthew 22. We talk about how and they're, they're kind of just this one and the same. Uh, you can't love God and hate your brother because that just doesn't make sense. And so if you love God, you're going to love others. And, and if you're loving others with the love of God, then you're going to have this open, honest relationship with who God's created you to be. They're one and the same. Now, uh, a couple about a month ago, we did this thing on Sunday night, and we kind of talked about what our core values are going to be. And so one thing we talked about is we're going to be a Christian people. Unashamedly, we believe in who Jesus is and what he's called us to do and who he's called us to be. The other two is we believe in holiness. Like we are just unashamedly, we believe God calls us to live a certain life. It's not just come and save and I'm good. It's, there's more to life that I walk with God and I talk with God and I, I am who he's called me to be and I try to be exactly the way he wants me to be. I don't always live up to that, but it's not just come and get saved and I can go do whatever I want to. We believe that there's a life to be lived, a life of holiness because God said be holy because I am holy. And then the last one is um, we're going to be missional. Uh, and this whole idea is, you know what, we're not going to be um, all about just what happens in this room on a Sunday morning. We're going to reach out to our community. We're going to be a part of what's happening in their lives, whatever it takes. Just like I believe that love God and love others is this one and the same. You, they're not like two separate commands. It's almost like one command. If you love God, you're going to love other people. I believe that these two guys are one and the same. That if you say you're a holiness and you say you're a holy person, 
you're going to be about God's business. And you're going to be reaching out to the people that God would want to have you reach out to. The whole movement of God working in my life is not a transaction. It's a transformation. It's not me just getting, it's me being transformed in the person that God wants me to be. The whole holiness thing is, it's not a moment. I mean, it, it, there's moments, but it's a movement. And when I join in with who God's called me to be, there's a moment where I say, you can be Lord of my life. But if I live in that moment for the rest of my life, I'm missing out on who God wants me to be right here and right now. And so it, it, it is a moment, but it doesn't stop there. That's just the beginning of what God wants to do in and through you from that point forward. Jesus' point is that even though there may be one fewer demon in Israel, more are going to come and inhabit because they're going to find a nice clean house and they're going to invite all their friends. And there could potentially be worse off than if they'd have never asked Jesus to do that for them. They asked Jesus for a sign. I wonder if we're guilty of that. God, will you do this? And then I'll do this. And if you'll just show me, you know what I'm saying? Like just rain down bread from heaven, that'd be awesome. God, if you could just perform a trick for me, then I'll know what it is you're calling me to do. If you just do this, and I wonder if he looks and he says, man, I died for you. And I rose again from the dead, the sign of Jonah, like I did it. And I wonder if we're just as guilty as the Pharisees. We know that he died and rose again so that we could have life, and yet we still, and God, if you could do something else, that'd be great. Have we been saved? Sure. But have we filled the space where our sin was, and now it's vacated. Have we filled it with the things that God wants for us? I, I think that uh, we talked about it last week a little bit, but we can't get on these Pharisees because I feel like we're there a whole lot of the time. And maybe you're here this morning and you say, man, I, I God has he saved me. But I wonder if you are here this morning and you say, you know what, I've been saved, but man, I'm idle. I am not living. I'm not being. I'm not moving in the direction that causes me to be more like Jesus. I mean, we, we testified, and man, I, I believe this. Man, God has sanctified me. God has, has done something in my life. But you know what? I'm really not reaching out as much as, as I, I, sh I, should, I should be. I come to church, that's awesome, and I hear about God, and I sing, and I, I do, and, and, and then I tithe, and, and I'm a part of what this is. But man, every, the rest of the week is, is kind of my time. And I wonder if idleness has swept into your life, and you think, man, I come, and, and God has done something. And I remember I can tell you the spot where I was when I prayed at a campground, at a retreat, at this altar. And you're living in that moment, and you said, man, I did it, and, and I prayed the prayer, and God saved me. It was, it was good, and, and you got up, and, 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 and life just kind of, because he didn't save you to take up space on his work. He saved you to be a part of his movement. He saved you to be a part of his kingdom. He saved you to reach into people's lives in the lowest place where nobody else will. And he called you to be different be about his kingdom. And if you're coming every week, we want you to be here. And, and so we can't look at this as this dualism. The disciples are good and the Pharisees are bad. Because if we're honest, we might have a little bit of each inside of us. And so we can't sit back and say, man, those Pharisees are evil. I need to step into this story. And say, is there anything in my life that's just idle? It's not seeking. It's not truly being everything that God has called me to be. Because I don't ever want to be at the place that I'm worse off than I was before Jesus did something in my life. I want to keep growing and being more like him every day of my life. So where are you? 
as you look at your life, you know, we, we got to celebrate those moments when people get saved. we got to celebrate who Jesus is. And we need to remember the times that God's spoken in our lives, those Ebenezers, those big times where we put stones down and we remember. But if we're living in that, that moment that happened 20, 30 years ago, last week, uh, yesterday, if I'm living in that moment and expecting that everything else is going to be okay, I'm missing the day-by-day -day transformation that God wants to have in me. I'm missing the exciting adventure that God has for me right now. I, I'm missing the, the, the people that I see every day that God could be asking me to speak into their life. But because I, I'm living in, well, I did it, Jesus. I, I, I said the prayer, and, and things are good, and I, but I'm missing who Jesus wants me to be right now. Because if you're just holiness, I mean, you're just kind of like a holy club, a Pharisee club. Oh, no, we can't call it that. That's, that's bad. Let's just call it what it is. Set apart for no good. And if we're just missional without the holy, well, then we, we're just like every other, well, not every other, but a lot of other nonprofits who, who do what they do, but aren't tied to the story of God and what God's trying to be about in our lives. We've got to have a moment where Jesus does something in us. But we can't just stand up and throw grenades about all the stuff that we're against. We have to allow him to fill us so that we can be for something. His kingdom, his mission, his love, his grace. Act justly, love mercy, and walk humbly. So that when we have people who are grieving and hurting, we don't just say, I hope somebody else goes. We don't just pray that God sends somebody in their life and, and maybe we realize God looks at us and says, man, I created you. You might be a good person. God, please go, go minister to them. Okay, I'm going to send you. You're, you're it. And we'll never stop seeking what God has planted in us. You see this blessing? May you. I'll be idle. <laughs> May you allow God to fill you like never before.